So, Father, thank you. We love you. We praise you. Uh, We ask, God, that you would speak to us now. And we ask, God, that we would turn our mind, our heart, our attention to you uh, in even a greater way as we look at your word. God, draw us close to you. Help us to open up our minds to what you want to teach us. But more than that, God, lead us into deeper relationship with you that we might come to understand exactly who you are. I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you. And I know that there are people in this room who come in here with different needs, Father, different reasons, different things that are on their hearts. I pray that you would meet those needs according to your riches. I pray that you would remind everyone in this room today that you are here and that your presence matters and we would find peace in you. I trust you for these things and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, if you have the church app, you can actually look on the app to the notes section. You're going to find there a message outline. It's got the outline of the sermon today along with the scripture verses. Uh, But if you have an old fashioned Bible like mine, you can turn to Genesis chapter two. That's where we're going to start. It's not where we're going to end, but it's where we're going to start today. There are in the United States of America some crazy laws that exist. Isn't that true? Some we like, some that we're not too fond of, but some are really weird that somehow back when they started kind of made sense for some reason, but kind of kept on the books. For instance, there's a law in Ohio that says it's illegal to get a fish drunk. I'm not even sure how you would do that, but that's the law in Topeka, Kansas. It's against the law to annoy a squirrel. And I thought, well, how do you annoy a squirrel? You act like a nut. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So some laws are crazy, don't make sense. But most laws, right, most laws are given to us for our benefit. Most laws kind of help. Uh, They kind of maintain the social order. Even though, again, we may not like some, they are really given for our benefit. If that's true of human laws, it's certainly true when it comes to God's laws. If there are laws, that there are commands that come from a loving Father in heaven, you can bet that they are given to us for our benefit. God does not provide His commands to us without compassion. Every law He provides, every command He gives us is for our best interest. God's not some cosmic killjoy that's setting up laws just to rule over us. They serve us best is the idea. They help us to live the highest quality of life. And in Scripture, there are commands given to two primary assets of living that I want to share with you today that I'm very excited about because I came across some of these truths a few years ago, a few weeks ago after studying some more. I thought, well, this is the week that I wanted to share these things with these folks as a result of some of the process that I've gone through in my own Christian journey, two very important areas of life. And you think about this, this is true. Our life revolves around these true, these two primary assets of living. What are they? Time and money. Time and money. Just let that sit. Life doesn't get more real, does it? Than with respect to the use of our time and our money. These are important, aren't they? Doesn't life revolve around the stewardship of these two things? And they're interrelated. We are making choices to spend money in order to save time. That's kind of the way this works. For instance, are we going to hire a lawn service to mow our lawn? Or are we going to do it ourselves? That's a choice about time and money. Are we going to bake brownies for the PTA, take the time to do that? Or are we going to just run by Kroger and pick some up on the way there? That's a choice about time and money. Alternatively, in order to have more money, we must also invest time. That's normally the way it works, right? We must give time in order to get more money. We must work more. We must go to school more. We must work overtime. We must work weekends, spend time smoothing the boss, whatever it is. We have to invest time in order to get more money. And since time and money are resources of life, very real resources of life, things that can be spent, things that can be saved, that means that they can get out of control. And we cannot manage them so well. And the mismanagement of time can lead to overwork, 
burnout or even a lack of productivity and laziness. That's a mismanagement of time. Mismanagement of money can lead to overspending. Materialism, crushing kind of personal debt, worry, anxiety. So wouldn't you agree today, folks, wouldn't you agree that at the end of life, the question of how I spent my time and how I spent my money determines the quality of the life that I live? That's true. That's so true. But here's the good news today. The good news is that God has implanted right in the middle of these two concerns. He has implanted laws, commands, principles, guidelines that if we have the faith and courage to put into practice, have the potential to greatly help us use our time and money as we should. These laws have the potential to help us find balance and to manage these things so that they don't go to extremes and so that they don't end up being spent on the wrong things. So what are the sets of commands given to us with respect to the assets of time and money? Here's the first one with respect to time. It's the principle, the teaching, the command of the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath is an offering of sorts to God. An offering of a full day of our week to God. Giving that part of our real lives to Him. Now, this principle, this precedent was set long before the law came into existence. Before the law of Moses. In fact, we see it in God himself in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Look at what it says about God himself. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, there is no command in this particular passage for you and me to rest. It's just explaining that God rested. Yet, it does say that the seventh day was set apart. It was sanctified. It was made holy by, by God because it was the day that God rested from his work. God rested from his work not because he grew tired. He doesn't grow weary. It's because he took that day to reflect and to ponder and to look upon his creation and to celebrate his creation as good. So he rested from the work that he was doing. And in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments are contained. You know the top ten. Where Moses is given these Ten Commandments for the people of Israel, the fourth command in the Ten Commandments expresses the desire of God for his children to rest and to restore on the seventh day. And this command, we're going to read it here in just a moment, is very clear. It's very clear and it's quite compelling. Exodus 20, it says this, Remember the Sabbath day. As I do, don't forget it. Don't just kind of hydroplane past it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In other words, it belongs to Him. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, notice we are not called upon to sanctify the Sabbath. That's already taken place. The Sabbath was made holy. As the children of God, we are called upon to protect it from becoming unsanctified. It was made holy by God, but the way that God's children conduct themselves in relationship to it can profane the Sabbath. Because here's the main idea of the Sabbath. The main idea of the Sabbath, and this is actually what the word means, is the cessation of work. It means to cease from work. And we understand that to mean for the purpose of rest, not just rest of our physical bodies, but the restoration of our spiritual selves, the restoration of our souls. Both of those things take place in the Sabbath, should. The all-inclusive language in Exodus 20, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the livestock, all are to cease from working. It shows how important this is to God. 
eventually this Sabbath rest that was instituted there in the Ten Commandments would make way for worship to begin to occur on the Sabbath as you push further into the Old Testament, in particular the uh, books of Leviticus and Numbers, in time, worship would become a part of this holy day made possible. Why? Because work was absent from it. And as I thought about that this week, I, I thought about why this correlation is very interesting to me. Why you have to have both of these things take place at the same time. Why the correlation between the absence of work and holiness? Because work can be fun. And work can be fulfilling. There are many of you in the room who actually love your jobs. But we know this is true also. Work becomes harmful. When we lose the ability to step away from it. Because work can stand in the way of worship. Working on a day that is set apart for godly rest, listen, is the worship of work. The idea here is that you can worship God or you can worship work, but you can't worship both. What's it going to be? And by practicing the Sabbath, we proclaim to God, God, I will worship you, not my work. We struggle with that, don't we? In our world today, we struggle with this because we have an addiction to achievement. Some of us are recovering achievement addicts, right? We just, we're used to the grind. And some of you in the room, I understand this. Some of you, when you relax, you feel guilty. That's kind of sick, isn't it? But it's kind of the way it is for some folks. You feel selfish or irresponsible or you feel undisciplined. There's still work to do, you say to yourself. And so you feel like you're not being as productive. I could be more productive doing some work, getting some work done. Things will crash. Things will burn if I step away from my work. I mean, my people need me. My organization needs me. My company needs me. My team needs me. And we think we're indispensable. So the Sabbath does not mean being finished with work. That's not it at all. Rarely do we finish in one week the work that we have to do in that week. Rarely do we. Instead, get this. Please get this. This is the spirit of the Sabbath. This is why this is so important for us today, in today's world. The Sabbath means being free from the internal need to work because we all need it, right? We say they need us, but internally we need it. See, we think that they're indispensable or we're indispensable to them. It's actually that we feel like they're indispensable to us. We can't live without them. The world will continue on without you. It's going to be okay. And by trusting God with the Sabbath, we're actually able to see our lives become more productive. This is the promise of God when we trust him. It's amazing how efficient life gets and how productive we can actually be when we trust God with our work. So Sabbath is the antidote to workaholism which, by the way, is the worship of work. In itself, is, it's not going to cure workaholism. Please don't hear me say that. The other six days are really important. All of it belongs to God. We've got to manage it as God would want us to also. But the Sabbath becomes the tipping point. It becomes the place that we start. It becomes the guideline by which we can manage and arrange our life in a different way so that we can actually push into the priorities of God as we should in our time. The Sabbath is the principle. God's loving command to help us draw boundaries around labor and live healthy, emotional, and spiritual Lives. So that's the uh, management of this asset of time, this principle of the Sabbath. Again, the starting point for getting it right. But what about our money? Tithing. Tithing. The practice of the tithe. Now, if this is new language to you, you're new to church, you're new to faith, tithing simply means giving 10% of our income to the Lord given through the local church for the support of the work of God in the ministry so that people are blessed, eternity is impacted by some portion of the resources that God has given to me. 
Now, this also predates the law of Moses. I, I need you to understand that. Because people will proclaim it's legalism. It predates the law. In Genesis chapter 4, for example, we see that Cain and Abel gave an offering to the Lord. So there from the beginning was an offering being offered to God. Of what? Of the resource, the commodity that they had. For us, it would be our money. In Genesis chapter 14, we also see how Abraham gave a tithe of what he had to the priest Melchizedek. Many theologians believe that Melchizedek was the pre-incarnate Christ. The Bible describes him as someone who had no beginning and no end. And so Christ himself, Abraham was offering to God this tithe of all that he had. Then we push into the law of Moses and we see the actual commandment for tithing. The loving command of God. Here's where it is in Leviticus 27. says this, And all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, notice it, it's all encompassing. Basically, whatever is our income is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Later, through the prophet Malachi, we see the Lord's condemnation of those in the Jewish priesthood, these spiritual leaders who were not tithing. And we also see in this passage the promise of God to those who would. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, here are the words of God through the prophet Malachi, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test. Says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Get that, until there is no more need. God is saying to his children, I will provide for you as you trust me with this resource of your life. He's saying the same thing in the Sabbath. If you trust me with your time to obey my commands, I will provide for you. I will provide for you in this resource of money. So the main idea for the tithe is not the cessation of work. It's the cessation of want. To say that 90% is enough, that, that I am free from the need for more, and that I can give up one-tenth of it, to say, I have, I have enough. And God, thank you for providing for all that I have. All of it's yours. But here, I give this to you as a way of symbolizing the fact that I trust you in this area of my life. So tithing stands as the antidote to greed, which is the worship of money. Are you getting a sense of what I'm, I'm talking about with respect to the idea of worship? It... it, it it could be worshiping work or it could be worshiping money. Jesus said it himself. He said, you cannot serve God and money. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So again, tithing is not going to cure greed. I'm not saying that, but it's a tipping point. It's a place to start. The rest of our money matters as well. How we manage it, how we save it, how we spend it, how we invest it. All that matters to God. But this is the practice, the command that allows us to start moving in the right direction toward the management and the stewardship of this thing called money. Now, there are those that believe that Jesus rejected both the Sabbath and the tithe. I do not believe that that's true. When it comes to the uh, mispractice of it, the, uh, the wrong practice of it that he witnessed among the relig religious leaders, absolutely, he condemned it. It was shameful what they were doing with the Sabbath and with tithing. When it was practiced incorrectly, yes, Jesus re rejected it. But look at what he says about himself in Matthew chapter 5. He said, do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to reject it, to wipe it away. But rather, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Here, here's what I'm saying. Jesus did not reject the Sabbath. He intended to fulfill the spirit of it. He rejected the legalistic practice of it, having the law of it, but not embracing the spirit of it. He rejected the omission of the spirit of the Sabbath. 
in its practice. The Sabbath still stands as a principle of rest and restoration for you and me that is so important, especially in our day and age, that every week for 24 hours, I figure out a day, whatever day that is, I figure out a day that is set aside for restoration, rest, and for worship. That principle, I believe, still stands today. The same is true for the tithe. Jesus intends to fulfill the spirit of the tithe. He he rejected the legalistic practice of it. He rejected the omission of love and joy and generosity in it. He rejected those things. But the principle still stands. That I give a full 10% of my earnings to God as a token for all that he's given to me. It is his already. It is holy unto the Lord for his use and for his purposes. Now, there are amazing similarities between these two, and this is why I was excited to share this with you today. Because they stand in stark contrast to the world in which we live. God's loving commands from a loving Father in heaven, from his heart, he desires something better for you and me as the children of God. And these two things, with these real aspects of our real lives, God seeks to bring peace to that which causes chaos. We know this is true. It doesn't even need to be said. There is such a lack of peace in our lives and people in this room with respect to the use of our time and the hurriness of life and the craziness of life and the pace of life, all those things. There's such chaos with respect to money and how it overwhelms and how it controls us and how it brings about worry and anxiety. We know that to be true. God desires something different for his children. These are stepping off points to get to that place to bring peace and perspective. So what are these similarities? It's so ingenious of God to do this. What are the similarities between Sabbath keeping and tithing? Well, first, both imitate God. When we rest as God rested, when we give as God gave, we become what? We become godlike. We become godly. That's what godliness is. It's the essence of godliness, becoming like God. And as we become like him, guess what? We are drawn close to him. We have greater fellowship with him. Both are holy to God. In Exodus 20, he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Leviticus 27, the tithe is holy unto the Lord. These are things, not Only these things, but these are things that separate us as God's holy people that are unique as the children of God that say to the world that we belong to him. And because we belong to him, we give him this part of our lives in order to represent the fact that we are his children. Both are an antidote to the culture. I've already mentioned this some, but the culture is pressing in on us, isn't it? And the culture is pushing us into a mold Workaholism, constant want, greed, materialism, selfishness, all these things are pressures that we feel. But Sabbath keeping and tithing swim against that current. They are avenues, paths by which to push into virtues like contentment and peace in these areas where there's often chaos and confusion. Both bless me in return. Both are truly an investment in myself. Resting blesses me by recreating me and refueling and restoring me. Tithing blesses me by learning to be generous and the joy of giving becomes a part of my life. I learn, as Paul said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I learn how good it is to invest in others with the resources that God has given me. Both set my priorities in the proper place Listen, both are practical ways to actually indicate what is most important in my life. Because time and money tends to run our lives. By keeping the Sabbath, we say, no, I'm going to tell time what to do. By tithing, we say, no, I'm going to tell my money what to do rather than the other way around. And I'm going to use it as God would want me to. Get this, both are proportional. Sabbath keeping is one-seventh of my week. Tithing is one-tenth of my money. Both are systematic. Both are God's ingenious way of providing a plan, a guideline for stewardship. We all need a plan. Without it, we only talk and never do. 
But God provides a system, a plan by which we can push into the stewardship of our resources in the way that we should. Both are sacrificial. In today's world, to truly Sabbath and to tithe is quite amazing. You say, well, it's only one-seventh of my week. It's only one-tenth of my income. But this is significant, folks. And again, it helps us learn that all belongs to God. Both create the desire for right things. They are disciplines that lead to desire. If you only get the discipline and never push into the desire, yes, you've missed the point. You've missed the spirit behind the Sabbath and behind the tithe. But both press into the eternal. With all that we do with time and money, we are doing some of those things. We are using some of those for what matters the most. Most Sabbath allows me to stop, see the world, see my blessings, ponder, worship, and to serve God with joy. Tithing allows me to see how money rules my life and instead how it can impact others in their eternity. And then here's the final thing. Both reveal my level of trust in God. They unveil our level of trust in God. And I don't mean to be direct, but yes, I do. Um, there's something inherent in going to church. There's something inherent in being part of religion where we only proclaim our trust in God, but never really practice it. And I want to say to you, if you've got more proclaiming going on than practicing in your Christian life, you're probably just kind of indifferent. You're kind of just, okay. The gap between what you proclaim and what you practice is indeed the, the place where the power and presence of God exists. It is in that place right there where we find the Christian life is a life of joy and is worthwhile, but it takes courage, it takes faith to narrow that gap. So Sabbath keeping, keeping and tithing illustrate practical trust in God. One way we might think about it is that by not doing so, we're really expressing, expressing practical atheism. You get it? Because we're not practically trusting God. And nothing gets more real in our lives than our time and our money. Not just saying we trust God, but that we actually do. So the Sabbath and the tithe, therefore, since they reveal and unveil our level of trust, here's what's true about both of them. Both are an act of faith. Both are a step of real faith. Sabbath means trusting God with our time. And by default, folks, listen, if we trust God with our time, what does that mean? By giving him this day, one day a week, where we come, we worship, not to punch the clock and check the box, but we come and we open up our hearts to God to find the restoration that's found, the peace, the power, the perspective that is found in genuine acts of worship, we come and worship and we serve. Many of you serve. It's an act of worship where you rest, where you restore, where you figure out a way for this day to be filled with retreat, activities that are different from the normal six days, where relationships that are life-giving are a part of this day for you. All these things restore the self in a powerful way. And when we do, Guess what happens? God has a way of taking care of our jobs and our organizations and our careers and our productivity. He has a way of taking care of our family with whom we engage on the Sabbath. He has a way of taking care of our church with whom we engage. Let me just say to you that the Sabbath is not just some nice little suggestion that God gave. I think so many Christians in the, in the United States of America, in our Christian culture, 
we, we miss the true meaning of it. Some of you feel if you get to church once or twice a month, you're doing pretty good. I'm just saying to you, that's not pushing into the real spirit of the Sabbath and what the life-giving community of faith should be. It's not pushing into the idea of what worship means week in and week out that I will stop and I will tell my schedule what I will do on that day. And I will be with the family. And it will be a regular and consistent part of my life. That's Sabbath keeping. And there will be blessings by doing that. The same is true with our tithe. It means trusting God with our money, the substance that we worry so much about and get preoccupied about, it's saying, God, here, here, I don't want to let it go, but here, it's all yours. As a symbol that all of this is yours, I give you this portion of my life because, God, I trust you. I really trust you. I'm not just saying I trust I really, really trust you. Here's the good news. Though the Bible is not ambiguous here. These are not, not nice recommendations, not nice suggestions from God. These are clear commands. But the good news is this. They are clear commands from a loving Father in heaven who seeks your very best. And folks, listen, who wants to take responsibility for you? And who knows in his heart that he can provide for you with respect to your time and with respect to your money? He knows that. He longs for you to know that. So, the question for you and me today is, will we trust God enough to do what he commands? Now think about, what would be that next step for you? I don't, I don't know what that would be for you. But what would be that next step for you? Maybe for some of you, it's just first giving. Giving to the work of God in this world. Maybe for some of you, it's actually saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make worship an important part of my life. I'm going to give God more than just leftovers. I'm going to give God my time, my attention. I'm going to give him some of my money. And I can express in this small way just some trust to God. Maybe you say, well, I've got the tithing down. No problem there but you really haven't pushed into what the Sabbath truly means and the blessing that can be in your life. There's some great books out there. Go and read, understand what this day can mean to you. Commit yourself to it. That would be your next step. Or maybe you've got the Sabbath thing down, but it's the other, it's the money. It was funny in, in our life and with Tammy and me, the, the giving thing came really early on and it was not, a, not an issue, but I did not know about rest and Sabbath. And it caught up with me. You know what the old saying is? The old saying is, if you don't take the Sabbath, the Sabbath will take you. You know how it'll take you? It'll take you in the form of your health and your mental wellness. I didn't know about it. And I didn't practice it until about five years ago. And much of the stuff that I studied and learned back then, I'm sharing with you today. So it's important. What's, what's your next step? What would it be like for you to trust God more with your time and with your money? Will you have the courage and faith to do so? Let's bow in prayer. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just let me ask you to reflect and to respond Think about um, these two areas of life. They're real, aren't they? Some of you walked into the room with burdens with respect to one or both of these. I want to remind you today that God is a God of grace, compassion, and love. These things that He's commanded to you and me are given from heart that seeks our very, very best. And we have a Father in heaven that we can trust, that we can depend upon. Who takes responsibility for us. 
And I just feel in my heart today that beyond this thing of time and money, that there are some in the room that need to be reminded of that. That need to be reminded that God is there in this time of challenge and suffering that you're having. It could be health. It could be responsibility that you have for other people. It could be relationships, burdens that you carry every day. Some of you are working up with responsibilities every day. And that burden gets so heavy. Reminds you that God is there to carry it with you and for you. And you can trust Him in every area of life. So whatever it is, whatever point of worry or anxiety you have, that point, that thing about which you're burdened is the opportunity for you to trust God with that very thing. That you can leave here from this place with a lighter heart than what you had when you came in. So, Father, thank you for being that kind of father. Thank you for being a God who longs to provide for and protect his children. I pray that you would give us the courage that we need to follow you fully, the faith that we need, and then, God, the strength to endure as we know that life has challenges, and that life will swim against this and come against this and seek to shape us and mold us that we could be set apart as your children. We could walk in that holiness and do so only through your power. So thank you for that promise. Help us to leave this place, God, having trusted you with that which is on our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.